Now it is my honour and my privilege this afternoon to be introducing our next speaker here, who is going to be telling us all about the Open Compute Project. Everyone, Andrew Ruffin. Uh, thank you, Sheree. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, very quick question. How many people here, just put your hands up, have heard about the Open Compute Project? <laughs> Fantastic. How many of you have read, no, have re just read a couple of articles about it? Okay, cool. So I'm going to be giving you a quick history about the Open Compute Project, uh, a little bit about where it's gotten, gone to now, and then my experiences using it and what's happening in Australia and New Zealand with it. So first off, what is the Open Compute Project? Uh, fun many, family free computing. Uh, you know, why, why do we bother with the fancy cases? Why do we need those silly front panels that you get on certain vendors' computers that people only ever put on, on them for the photos after you've racked them? Well, we don't need this stuff. Let's, let's get, away with, get away from that kind of stuff. Uh, let's strip down the servers that we're getting. We don't need video cards in them. You know, we use serial consoles to get in and manage them. Uh, and how many expansion cards do you actually need to be, put, be able to put into a server? You know, I put in CPUs, RAM, and a couple of hard drives. That's all I need. And maybe some network cards. Uh, efficient computing. And in this case, we're actually talking about things like maintenance, airflow, uh, the electricity that you're actually using to drive the computers. Now, why do we need to put multiple power supplies into every single server that we put into a rack. Now, let's strip some of those out, centralise that stuff and get more efficient power supplies. Now, with the airflow, let's do slightly bigger computers, not do little one U pizza boxes with a billion fans in them that sound like a jumbo jet when you turn them on, because that's what you need to cool them down. Uh, on the maintenance, how many people have worked on servers where you've got little tiny screws to hold the cases on? How much time do you waste looking for the screw that fell on the floor? Uh, let's get away from that kind of stuff. You know? Worst case scenario, they fall down through the vent grills and the raised floor. And you go, ah, lost that screw. <laughs> Not going to go under there. Uh, so let's look at this kind of stuff. And Another part of around the Open Compute Project was to look at things like the voltages that you're using. Uh, and more of a, a case for the US, uh, where you know, they use silly little voltages, and, which causes other interesting things. Uh, not such an issue for Australia and New Zealand. The, the nice thing, though, is one of the fundamental designs for the service that I've used is it uses three-phase power for the rack, which makes things easier to manage. Uh, and I'll touch on support and management a little bit later. So where did the Open Compute Project come from? So it came out of Facebook when they built a new data centre in Oregon in 2011. They decided that why should we do a traditional data centre? Let's step back and design everything from the ground up. They reconsidered the power, the cooling and the servers. So most of us don't get the opportunity to build a data centre at this scale, so we, so we don't have the opportunity to step back and, and do this kind of big, big picture thinking. Uh, but they did do that, so that's fantastic. And so this was the first generation Open Compute server that was released. Uh, this is Amir Michael, who was the hardware design manager at Facebook at the time. Uh, it might be hard to see, but the motherboard is actually stripped down a bit there. There's very few I.O. ports on the, on the front of it. Everything is at the front of the case, except for the hard drives, which are actually at the back, but um, that's changed in future generations. Um, so they did get a chance to stop, step back, and have a good think about it. Now, interestingly enough, uh, Facebook has said that in their traditional data centers, using typical servers, they would have one tech to 2,500 servers. When they switched the OCP, they had one tech to 22,000 servers. So when I talked about 
reduced uh, maintenance and support, this is one of the benefits you get. So where did it go? It went to a foundation. They released it as open source and created the Open Compute Project Foundation. So they started this alongside Rackspace and Intel, and since then, there's over 190 companies involved in that foundation, and it keeps on growing. 32% of those are APAC, but most of that 32% are from the northern areas of APAC. I counted one from Australia in that picture. So we're not very well represented at this stage in Australia and New Zealand. Let's try and change that. So what is it? It's very wide ranging. These are the uh, main sections that are in there. Uh, there's more than 4,000 engineers working and sharing across the nine projects that are here. Uh, we've got data center, storage, servers, the open rack, high performance computing, networking, telco, hardware management, and interoperability. Each of those projects has a project lead, and they then break down further into subgroups that work on particular areas. So, and there's also an incubation team that review new projects and new specs, and once they've been approved, they go up on the OCP website, uh, which being able to see those specs when you're working on some of the hardware can be incredibly useful. So it's got the projects and technologies. Sorry, my, I can't really see the slide very well there. Uh, there's a foundation board which has got seven members. They're not paid positions. That, and the end user focused. So just because you're a top tier member of the foundation doesn't guarantee your a seat on the board, which is you know, fantastic. Uh, and it's about the designs and the specs. So the member organizations are expected to submit their specs and get them approved by the Open Compute Foundation, and then they get made available to people. And we're seeing continually new specs coming out, new hardware, and I've just got a few showcases from the last past year. So from Rackspace and IBM, we've got the Barrow Eye, which is an open power based machine. Uh, on this particular one, all the I.O. ports are actually on a daughter card at the front. So the plan was that you could just take that I.O. card away and design your own one, so you could customise the server for what your particular need was, for what I.O. ports you needed to have. Uh, now, there was actually a new spec that was released last month to uh, update the design and make some improvements, including different height options and other configurations. They've actually removed the I.O. daughter card from that particular spec. Um, now, also, uh, Stuart Smith gave a talk at LCA last year about doing the firmware for this. So if you want to know the gory details about writing firmware for an open hardware server, have a look at his talk. Uh, we also believe it's the only server that's shipped with an open source BMC. So this machine is open source from the ground up. I think that's pretty awesome. Uh, the other thing that's come out of, the, uh, out of uh, Rackspace recently is uh, this lunchbox power supply unit. So this is actually used for testing the open compute servers on a bench top. Because otherwise, uh, they, they take 12 volt power on the back, it's very hard to plug it into the wall normally. Uh, what I did was I went down to JCAR and bought a 12 volt benchtop power supply unit and I hardwired that into the server motherboard. <coughs> um, it makes it, you know, as long as you don't put the load up too high, it ran okay, um, but it couldn't quite provide quite enough grunt for the server under heavy load. Um, so having Test hardware like this makes life a lot easier. Uh, and we've also seen designs coming from the likes of HPE. So this is their, one of the cloud line servers. Uh, this takes up to 80 10 terabyte hard drives, uh, up to two compute nodes, so you put 800 terabytes into that uh, for you box. The other interesting thing about this particular one is it's a 19 inch server. So you don't need to go uh, I'll talk a bit more about some of the, other, the, some of the OCP stuff, but uh, one of the projects I mentioned was the open rack, and that's a specific uh, rack for OCP. This doesn't need it. So there's open compute project hardware that's available for traditional servers, uh, traditional server racks. 
So, you know, you know, very important. And we even have designs coming out of Microsoft. So, this hardware is driving the uh, Microsoft Azure Cloud. Uh, it's a 12U blade chassis. There's a bunch of different designs for different uh, blades for it. Standard 19 inch rack. And Microsoft have publicly stated that this cuts their deployment times by 50%. So we've seen significant reductions in time. Uh, it's pretty cool. Uh, HPE have blades available for this chassis. Uh, Microsoft has also recently contributed uh, the Project Olympus, which is a whole family of servers and all the components that go within it. So there's, yeah, pretty cool. Uh, and they've got stuff for 90 inch racks, open racks, tower servers, a whole heap of different options. And those all contributed in November. Uh, there's now a subgroup uh, that is looking at these specifications and potentially going to make some improvements to them if the community feels that they need to. And the other part is involvement. So anyone can, can pretty much get involved. Uh, you can sign up as a personal member, which is what, what I've done. Organizations can sign up and, and uh, join the foundation. Uh, there's mailing lists, IRC, Facebook, LinkedIn, all sorts of different options. And uh, there's annual summits and more regular engineering workshops as well, where people actually you know, work on the hardware. So that's what it is. What's happening in Australia and New Zealand? Telstra, here in Australia, have done an OCP deployment. They've got two racks of uh, OCP decathlon servers, which are traditional 19-inch boxes. So they just took their standard racks and put some OCP servers into it. They've ordered two racks of uh, open rack servers. So those are 21-inch 20 20 racks, sorry. They've also done a lot of uh, deployments of open networking, which are running uh, Cunus Linux on them. Uh, and that's all been supplied by a company called Hyperscalers in Australia. They actually have a lab in Canberra, so if you want to go and see this, see this hardware in action in Australia, uh, get in touch with hyperscalers. Um, I can help put you in, in touch with them. Rackspace has OCP stuff here in, in Australia. Uh, the bare metal offering is running on this stuff. Uh, interestingly enough, I heard that uh, without OCP, the bare metal offering probably wouldn't exist because they needed to have access to the firmwares all the way down to be able to make sure that they are uh, happy with the security aspects. So, pretty awesome. There's a large gaming site. Sadly, I can't say who that is, but there's someone else. And there's my company, Catalyst IT. We're doing some OCP. So, what I'm going to talk about is why OCP for Catalyst? We love free and open source software. We use it, we work on it, we contribute, we believe in it. Why can't we have open source hardware? Uh, we have got racks and racks of, tra of traditional uh, hardware from a bunch of different vendors. Those are black boxes. Literally, they're black boxes on the front, they're nice and black. But they're also black boxes. We don't have access into them. We, we can't look at the firmwares. We can't validate what's going on on them. Uh, so we love the idea of open hardware and being able to potentially contribute back to those designs. We also have a cloud offering. OCP, funny enough, is quite appropriate for cloud scale. Uh, we often tell people that they should treat virtual machines as cattle. Maybe we should treat the servers as cattle as well. And once you start deploying more servers at more scale, you can start to do that. Hi, me. So I've been working on the Catalyst Cloud since before as a product, 2011, 12. It's hard to tell, it's a bit blurry. Um, I managed our data centers in New Zealand. Uh, quite recently, I uh, fitted out a new data center. We deliberately left spaces for OCP racks to go on there. We made sure that the, all the cable trays were at a right height to allow that, and that we put in sufficient power, because we decided that we were really keen on this stuff. Uh, I've been following OCP since 2012. I started chasing it following a uh, OpenStack summit in Hong Kong in 2013, where I got the CSON on their hardware, and I started talking to the integrators 
in some cases, trying to talk to them as graders about it. Uh, so because of this, I was really interested in this stuff. And we finally bought an open rack in 2016. So managed to get, managed to get a director to sign off on it. Um, all our directors are very keen on the idea. So unfortunately, we only have one compute node so far. There's a photo of it. So uh, that was taken Friday last week. So that's called a Winterfell. That's a current generation compute node. Uh, it's two RU high. There's three of those put to a rack, uh, to a tray. In a 42 OU rack, you can fit 54 of those. If you go up to 48 OU, you can fit 63. So uh, as other interesting things you can see, this is an open rack. So at the back, you can see those black bars going up. Those are 12 volt power rails. So the servers don't have their own PSUs. They just run off 12 volts. Uh, that's got a hot lava, four gig, 10 gig, four port, 10 gig NIC. And the other thing is, you see all the thumb screws? You don't need any tools to work on this machine. Uh, we've, we've stripped it down, we've had a good play around with it. It's really, really simple to work on. It's, uh, it really is quite nice. That's our power shelf and our beautiful Cumulus Linux uh, switches from Penguin Computing. Love the yellow. Um, those are actually 12 volt uh, switches, so they're running off the rails as well. Uh, Penguin Computing have only just made those available when we decided to buy them. So the power cables on the back are actually custom made couplings to go onto the 12 volt rails. It's that stuff that new. Uh, so this power spell shelf, uh, there are six PSUs in there. Uh, the, there's two three-phase circuits running in the back of it, and it's N plus N redundant. So, and it's not actually quite grunty enough to power the entire rack when it's full, but it's still pretty good. So, I can see there's some issues from my experiences that I've come through for Australia and New Zealand. The first one of those is scale. We are small on the OCP stage. The entire deployments that we've had in Australia and New Zealand are minuscule compared to what's going on for just a single Facebook data center. You know, we're working with one or two racks with a few servers uh, internally for Catalyst, and we'll be deploying single servers, hopefully more than that, as we, as we grow it. Some integrators I talked to were like, yeah, we do 100 plus rack deployments, so you want to do a proof of concept. When are you going to start ordering 100? And my response would be, well, you know, that's probably enough to power the entire computing needs for New Zealand. So not any time soon. I don't know why, but they didn't respond to my emails after that. <laughs> so the ones that I have been talking to, supply chain is an issue. They don't send stuff to New Zealand. They don't know how to ship to New Zealand, how to sell, deal with our GST and things like that. So that was, you know, that was definitely going to be an issue as well. A few of them were like, yeah, look, we can make it work. That's fine. Uh, I end up turning to our existing integrator to handle that importing because it's a lot of paperwork. <laughs> I can't be bothered with that kind of stuff. Let someone else who deals with that all the time take care of that for me. But since I started looking into this and in the past six months or so, we've started getting more options. There's now hyperscalers in Australia. Uh, there's no one based in New Zealand, though, that's doing this. Um, Fortunately, people like Hyperscaler will actually ship to New Zealand. Uh, so that's, kind of, that's pretty cool. And there are other people like Penguin Computing who will, do this, will ship to New Zealand, but they don't have the support stuff there yet. So, and that support stuff, that's an issue as well. Because support becomes an issue when this happens. Who can see the red lights there? That means there's no 12 volt power coming out of that power supply unit that power supply sh shelf broke. Fortunately, it was before I put in the production. It was just after it wrecked the, uh, the penguin switches and a colleague and I were standing back going, now, how are we going to secure those um, couplings? And then the rack turned off. Ooh. <laughs> oh dear, <laughs> that's not so good. Uh, we thought that only single power supply units would fail on that shelf. We hadn't considered that the entire unit might actually fail. Uh, so we've got two, two new power supply units sent out. That's 1B and 4B uh, in there. Uh, unfortunately, it still didn't work. So we finally got a new power shelf sent out to us. Uh, that's been working okay for the, I installed it at the start of December. It's been working okay since then. 
Uh, we still don't have this rack in production yet. Um, but, you know, I hope we're going to be able to get there soon. So, what lessons have I learnt out of this? Scale is an issue for failures as well as supply. So, have more than one power shelf. Split your load between those power shelves when you're, if you're going to start small. Ideally, have at least two racks and four power shelves. Uh, another area of scale is getting new equipment certified. So I'm talking to a, a potential supplier who's got a very nice power shelf that I quite like the look of. The problem is it's not certified for use in Australia or New Zealand. To get it certified, there needs to be a minimum order quantity of 10. I'm not going to walk out and buy 10 power shelves right at the moment. So I'm trying to find people that want to go in and say, yes, we'll buy one. Uh, hopefully more than one. Uh, so that's another potential issue of scale, a certification. And then there's trust in new hardware. This stuff is pretty new. There's no one else in New Zealand using it. I know one university that had a couple of uh, test nodes, but they've sent them back now because they're only on loan. So it's really hard to talk to other people within the community and find out how they're finding them. Uh, I've talked to uh, people about the power shelves, and everybody I've talked to said, we've had no issues with those ones. But they're dealing at bigger scales as well. So their failure domain is, is a bit bigger. So if you want to do your own deployment, what can you do? If you're doing a green field data center, then it's quite easy. You, know? you can use the data center designs. You should allow for some 48 OU racks. They're two and a half meters tall. That's pretty chunky. Make sure you run those you know, suitable circuits to them. Um, consider that the data center designs also talk about things like airflow, how you should do the cooling, and manage all of those kinds of aspects. So there's, there's some quite comprehensive information there. If you're doing an existing data center, then maybe you want to consider some modifications based on those data center designs, because there's some pretty good ideas in them. Uh, I meant that space there. Uh, be aware that there are 19 inch servers. So you could deploy open compute without needing to change your racks. That's one of the things that I've heard people say, oh, but I don't have to buy new racks. You don't need to. Other thing to consider is that actually the rack isn't that expensive. So you could just replace them and put some smaller ones in. Uh, I've got one data center where I can't even fit the 42 OU racks into. So there's now half height racks available. So those are an option. And I'm quite tempted to use those in that particular data center. Uh, so some of these things, uh, some, some of these open racks come uh, as fully made units. They're welded together, shipped in big shipping crates. Kind of a pain to deal with when you're shipping to New Zealand. Uh, some suppliers will now ship them flat pack and you just make them up yourself. So I'm looking at that option as well. Make sure you check the widths. Our open rack, <coughs> I allowed a gap that was 600 mil wide that go between two other racks, it was 605 mil. Fortunately, one of those racks was empty. And we could loosen all the bolts off and move it aside a little bit and shove the new rack in. Uh, but some of the tolerances might, you know, just need to check the manufacturer and just check and make sure how wide these things are. Uh, because it could be, could get interesting otherwise. Another great way to get involved with doing your own deployment of open peer stuff is you can start with open networking. Who doesn't want to run Debian on their switches? Because that's what Cumulus Linux runs, is based on. It's pretty cool to SSH into your switch and edit slash et cetera network interfaces to configure your network switch. You can also you know, run Collect directly on your switch and all the other kind of things you want to do. So uh, it's pretty cool. So another aspect to look at is the supply chain. Uh, it is getting better. There are now options around for doing this kind of stuff in this area, uh, which is quite cray, quite cool. It's changed a lot since I started looking into it. Uh, and another thing is the community support is getting better. Uh, the Facebook group has been really great for finding out what's going on and where things are at. Uh, but that's predominantly American-based. Uh, 
but what we're going to be working on is uh, something which I'm going to invite Steve Halvey up to have a quick chat about now. Uh, Steve is the VP of Channel Development for the Open Compute Foundation. Thank you, Andrew. Um, thanks, everyone. Uh, as Andrew mentioned, my name is Steve, and I am part of the full-time team at the Open Compute Project. So I'm currently based in Hong Kong, but I look after our channel, and that really is three different areas. One is end customer engagement, uh, the second is our reseller channel, and the third are component manufacturers. Um, as Andrew mentioned, we're seeing more and more traction. So there's really three things that's happening in the market. One is, regardless of the level of enterprise that I'm seeing, whether it be an old bank or a new gaming company or a public sector company, or a public sector organization. If they're writing new applications, they're looking at open hardware. Um, most of the last four dis discussions I've had in Europe have all been around Hadoop on open compute at various scale. The second thing that's happening is you're seeing the traditional suppliers move into open compute. So that would be the, the likes of HP uh, and Dell and these guys are all developing new lines of business because customers are pulling in that direction. And then the last piece, which is relevant for this market, is around the facilities piece. So we're seeing more and more companies on the colo side want to brand themselves as open compute ready as a differentiator, as well as to offer this hybrid approach. Uh, so what we plan on doing here uh, locally is we're kind of kicking off the community. So it's been incubation for the last um, year or so. Um, we have a, approved communities in Taiwan, Japan, and of course, North America. And these are working communities where in Japan we have 100 or so companies. They meet quarterly. Uh, same in Taiwan. Taiwan's a much smaller group, primarily manufacturing centric. Um, and what's important about this is that it allows you guys to create the demands for the regional needs. For example, in Japan, um, they have extreme seismic requirements. So they've now developed their own rack. Uh, that they will now be submitting to Open Compute that will be Japanese specific. And of course, uh, the power is the biggest thing happening in Japan now. So they're extremely interested in Open Compute for the power um, efficiency. So if you want to find out what's happening in Japan, uh, you can check out Yahoo. Um, Yahoo is deploying now Open Compute in Yahoo Japan in a container and across America and Yahoo Inc. Um, so we will be. Uh, kicking off the community here. We have a mailing list set up for Australia and New Zealand. And what we'll be doing with that mailing list is we will be then starting to communicate with you folks on a programmatic basis, getting feedback on what kind of information that you would like, whether it be a readiness session on specific projects, uh, how you can make sure that you're getting involved uh, appropriately. So this will be online sessions as well. And we hope to have engineering workshops um, and even some colo facilities that will have gear up and running. Uh, and we'll do kind of a rolling event maybe in, in a few cities across Australia. So this is the, the big deal. Um, we're hoping that everyone here uh, joins the mailing list at least to get a sense of, of what we hope to uh, accomplish. We're expecting big things from this region. So in my past experience, uh, you guys are more forward thinking than Europe. Um, right now, Europe is picking up. So over the last six months, uh, I've seen the switch from my pipeline of folks wanting to test open compute gear switch. Uh, at the beginning of last year, it was 40 to 50 percent in APAC and the balance in North America, and that has switched. APAC has dropped off to about 25 to 30 percent, and Europe has increased substantially. Um, and that's even including the Brexit issue. Um, all right, so that is it. Uh, I'll be up here later. And my information is um, steve at opencompute.org. If you have any questions at all, happy to answer. Thanks, Andrew. Okay. So, hand over. So, that ended up running a little bit faster than I anticipated it did from the. Uh, from our trial runs. Uh, so we're kind of in a position now where, are there any questions about this stuff? Good start. Good day. Um, I, I can see that the Open Compute Project has been 
primarily you know, from the sort of examples we've got so far, primarily um, focused on rack-based, high-density um, compute and storage. And I'm just wondering what, are, are there any sort of indications or interest for looking at you know, branching into either smaller hardware, even desktops or laptops or things like that, or is it just, is that a, a completely outside the bounds of, or outside the scope of the open compute? I think it's probably a, a question for Steve to answer there. The, uh, when you talk about the smaller components of open compute, um, OCP is essentially defined to everything inside the data center. The things that are happening outside of the data center, on the telco side, uh, Facebook has now started the telco infrastructure project, TIP. So if you just type in telco infra project Facebook, it'll take you to their site. That's everything that the telcos are working outside of the data center, access, backhaul, um, the little um, DCs that they want to put at the bottom of every cell tower um, and all of their internet. However, when I talk to uh, some other folks, not even on the telco side, but on the automobile manufacturers, they're trying to figure out, okay, if I have all of my new sensors for all of my automated cars, how is that? That's just essentially an extension of my data center. So we have to make sure that these interfaces work um, from all my open infrastructure inside the data center to all my open infrastructure. So it's very early days. Um, right now, I would say it's strictly inside the data center, but at least some of the automobile manufacturers and the telco guys are thinking about this. Uh, hi, uh, another engineering question. Um, I, I should say two engineering questions. One is uh, your design decisions around using 12 volt in the rack rather than, say, 24 with smaller cables. And the other design question is how did you go about getting EMC compliance in all of the different places that you're selling because it's, all the configurations are different by the sound of things? Uh, so I, my understanding about using the 12 volt power is because it's inside, the, it's just talking about doing it within a rack. And the, serve, and the motherboards are using 12 volt, 5 volt, and 3.3 volt. So it's probably a case of you're not taking DC power too, many, too long a distance. So 12 volts does the job okay. Uh, having said that, the bus bars are pretty chunky, uh, but they're not, they're not too big. So that's, that's kind of okay. Um, and the uh, other question, which has just slipped my mind, sorry, what was the. the this, Oh, right. Uh, electrical um, the compliance. other question was regarding um, EMC compliance, which is a, um, a particular set of tests you've got to do for um, ground, current, and mm. radio emissions. So the, the power supply shelves will have to be certified. We have to be certified for each country they're going to get used in. But because the servers are running at low voltage, my understanding is they don't have to be certified because they're only running, they're taking 12 volt input. I might be able to add to that if that's okay, Andrew. Um, yeah. So I think on the on the compliance side, as I recall, uh, the expectations is that the manufacturers of the hardware do use their normal uh, EMC compliance channels to get the re relevant regulatory approvals for each area where they have to sell. So in that sense, it's no different to any other kind of standard commodity commodity hardware. Um, and just briefly on the 12, I think. One of the other factors with the 12 watt bus bar design choice was, um, from memory, it re removes one regulation step because you can pretty much feed that for your drive bays. You know, you can have a slightly more, a slightly simplified uh, 12 volt supply rail internal to the systems as well. But that's both, both from slightly distant memory. But I believe that was the, the background. Thanks. Any other questions? Okay. Um, all right. Andrew, on behalf of the LCA team, you know how this works. <laughs> <laughs> I do. Thank you, you know Sherry. You how this works. Everybody, thank you, Andrew.